be the one holy and living God. Glory, Glory to God forever and ever. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God be with you. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, you have made all the peoples of the earth for your glory, to serve you in freedom and in peace. Give to the people of our country a zeal for justice and strength of forbearance, that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's holy word. A reading from the first book of Samuel. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Benina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. So he went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drank in Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply depressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow. O oh Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give you your servant a male child, then I will set before him as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, no, my Lord, I'm a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, 
but I have been pouring out my soul before you, Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The Lord of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said to him, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was set no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshiped before the Lord. Then they went back to the house of Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Her psalm appointed for today is from 1 Samuel, the second chapter. We will read the Psalms responsibly by whole verse. Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. I now derive my enemies because I rejoice in my victory. There is no holy one like the Lord, no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bowels of the mighty are broken, but the feeble serve on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry are fat with spoil. The barren has born seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash To make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might does one prevail. The Lord, his adversaries shall be shattered. The Most High will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the power of the anointed. A reading from the book of Hebrews. Every priest stands day after day at his service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all times a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, and since then has been waiting until his enemies would be a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified, and the Holy Spirit also testifies to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approve with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean 
from an evil, from any evil with a true, with evil conscience, and our bodies wash with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory Glory to you, Christ. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you not do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another, all will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when this will be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. I'm seeing snow flurries out there. It has nothing to do with the sermon. I'm just seeing snow flurries out there. In 1976, if you can remember back then, Pat Robertson, until recently the host of the 700 Club, predicted the end of the world would come in 1982, guaranteeing by the end of that year there was going to be a judgment on the world. Christian uh, writer Hal Lindsey wrote uh, that the decade of the 1980s would very well be the last decade of history, among his scenarios, a surprise nuclear attack from the Soviets. 1999, pilgrims flocked to the mystic Mount Benaha, it's in the Philippines, to welcome the new millennium, which many believed would bring the world to an end. Harold Camping, a Christian radio broadcaster, predicted the world would end on May 21st, 2011. Interestingly, he had previously predicted the Judgment Day would occur on September 6, 1994. So he continues to bob and weave. Of course, we know of Jim Jones, the founder of the Christian Doom Day called the People's Temple predicted the world would end with nuclear war. In anticipation, he and his followers died together, so to move to another planet for a life of bliss. Well, I could go on and on. My point being that doomsayers have been around for a very long time and will be around until the end of time, predicting their dates of doom. But Jesus has countered their words with those of his own, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. 
What we learn from Scripture is that there will be only one true sign announcing Christ's return, and that is when we all see him appearing upon the clouds. Turning now to our gospel reading for today, you might say we find some of Jesus' disciples getting caught up in the end times fervor as well. What gave rise to it was Jesus prophesying that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed. As Jesus leaves the temple for the very last time, his disciples can't help but express their awe at the magnificence of the temple's buildings and grounds. The Jewish historian Josephus provides us with a description of the temple's grandeur before its destruction in A.D. 70 with these words. Now, the outward face of the temple in its front wanted nothing, for it was covered all over with plates of gold of great wealth, weight, and at the first rising of the sun reflected back a very fiery splendor It made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn away their eyes, just as they would have done at the sun's own rays. But this temple appeared to strangers when they were at a distance like a mountain covered with snow. For as to the parts that were not gilt, they were exceedingly white. All of this Jesus now tells them will be destroyed. Not one stone will be left upon another. With this grave pronouncement of divine judgment on the temple for having become a den of thieves, it must have been a very quiet trek as Jesus and his disciples left the temple grounds that day and crossed the Kidron Valley. And then climbing up on the western side of the Mount of Olives, they sat down and took in the majesty of the temple now silhouetted against the sunset. We then learned that for the disciples, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they take Jesus aside and they ask him, tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Where Jesus has prophesied the destruction of the temple, they took a giant leap to conclude that he was, in fact, pronouncing the end of the age. That is why they ask in the plural, not just about the destruction of the temple, But when all these things, everything will be accomplished, Jesus pulls them back from the edge by saying that when they see certain things occurring, it is not the end, but the beginning of birth pangs, as God goes about the work of bringing forth the birth of a whole new creation, a new heavens and a new earth. As Christians, we profess in the Apostles' Creed and in the Nicene Creed that He, Jesus, will come again to judge the living and the dead. And in our communion service, we proclaim that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And if Christ has risen and ascended and has obviously not returned, we can rightly conclude that we now live in this in-between time, the period that has been described as the already and the not yet, of Christ having come as we await his coming again. So as Christians living in this in-between time, Jesus' words to his disciples remain very poignant for all generations, including our own, that we'll experience the presence of false prophets who will attempt to lead many astray, the rumors of war, of nation rising against nation, of earthquakes and famines. You might say these words paint a rather bleak and fatalistic picture of the world. Yet for the Christian, we can remain hopeful even in the midst of such dire predictions. And why? Because we know that God is still in control, that God still sits on his throne and remains sovereign. And this sense of hope is attested to in our epistle reading for today from Hebrews, which states that after Christ had offered his sacrifice for the sins of the world, he ascended to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Christ is risen, and he sits at the right hand of God. And although he is seated, Jesus is by no means idle. For we also know from Scripture that Jesus remains active in his present ministry as intermediary and advocate for all who approach God through him, and who now intercedes on each of our behalves. This is the blessed assurance all believers have as we continue to walk in a world 
that is groaning to give new birth. I think it's fair to say that we live in a world of ever-present danger. But for the believer, it is also a world of promise. For us, it is peril and promise. The peril has been predicted, but we also have a promise, the most important promise of all, of Christ himself. He said that he would never abandon or forsake us, that he will be with us until the end of the age. But just how are we to access this wonderful promise of our Lord? Our second reading provides us the answer. This access to the heavenly throne and the ongoing presence of Christ rests in three words, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. First, it is about faith. A faith that leads us through the sanctuary and into the very presence of God. And it is by this faith that we experience this ongoing communion with God. It is this union with God that we receive this present and future objective hope grounded in eternal salvation, that nothing can ever separate us from God. It is out of this faith and hope that we are compelled to lead lives of love, and a special love at that, a sacrificial love that would have us caring and encouraging others, and especially those who are caught up in the dangers of this present age, living in a state of hopelessness, a darkness that compels us to shine into their lives the light and love of Christ. You might say this presence of Christ in the world through us has a cause and effect dimension to it. The cause being faith, hope, and love that we possess and offer to a world in great need. The effect of which to result in the freeing of those in peril, providing hope and the pathway out for those in desperate situations. On this Sunday at St. Albans, we recognize two examples that continue to have such an effect on the world. The first being our military veterans who have, in times of war and peace, liberated countless numbers living under the yoke of tyranny and oppression. These veterans who have sacrificed of themselves, and in some cases their very lives, have done so not only out of duty to country, but for many veterans out of the cause of the Christian faith. We honor them. Secondly, today, the parish will recognize with a commitment of monetary support, homes for families. They reside here in Columbus as a ministry whose mission is to help homeless families regain stability in their lives. Out of this giving of St. Albans, you are corporately living into the Christian cause of faith by offering hope to families living on the most dreadful edge of all, that of, homeless, of hopelessness. In closing, I want us to return just for a brief moment to the greater theme of our lectionary for today, that of pondering the future. We may not know what tomorrow will bring for any of us, but as Christians, we know what we have. What we have is the promise and presence of God that will enable us to persevere and overcome the ways of this world by remaining steadfast in faith, unwavering in hope, and loving and serving one another until our Lord's return, which comes closer with every passing moment. Amen. Amen. In response to God's word now read and proclaimed, let us stand and affirm our faith by saying together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, 
of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he has worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. The prayers of the people. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our bishops, for the gathering, for our partners in ministry, especially homeless families, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. O oh, judge of the nations, we remember before you with grateful hearts the men and women of our country who in the day of decision ventured much for their liberties we now enjoy. Grant that we may not rest until all people of this land share the benefits of true freedom and gladly accept its disciplines. Pray for freedom for all. I ask your prayers for all who serve in the military, including Jake Brickton, Edward Dixon Jr., Christopher Dixon, Margaret Farrar, Andre Gibbons, Wesley Hammond, Sean Nealon, Lawrence Lars Overway, Walter Smith, Tyler Uja, Lawrence Wright, Aaron M. Yen, Peter Yen, Greg, Sean, and Abby. For those living and deceased who have served in the military, including David Harris Thomas, Karen L. Tish Alexander, William B. Alexander, Henry R. Benefil, Dan Carmichael, Jim Crane, Robert Dana Livingston, DeWitt C. Livingston, Robert C. Martin Jr., the Reverend John J. Moret, Herbert Stanley Price, David Howland, Sean P. Richard, Thomas John Everett Willie, Colburn Martin Addison, Bruce L. Christie, Tom Hooker, Michael Kilburn, Dr. William T. Paul, Christopher A. Stallman, John K. Stephan, W. Peter Williams, Jerry Becknell, Sheldon L. Dotson, John Edwards, Robert Howarth, Leno B. James, John McKinley, 
Dr. Richard O. Fowl, Henry L. Richter, Frank Scheike, Joel T. Thomas, Michael S. Dodson, Richard Theophil, Ted Shalinsky, Charles Chuck Devilbus, Dina Clinton Dixon, Dominique Dixon, William Ferguson, Virginia Jenny Gigi, John Tyler Lonert, John Tyler Lonert Jr., Daniel Eldon Lonert, Roger Marshall, Walter Smith, Dr. Richard Snyder, George Bud Troutman, and David White. For those preparing for military services, especially the Reserve Officer Training Corps, that they have a sense of duty, charity, and peace, pray for those who serve. I ask your prayers for Stephen, Ann, Sam, Ben, and Maria, who are serving in a place of danger. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, for the care of and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for all who have died. I ask your prayers for the missionaries kidnapped in Haiti, victims of natural disasters, those suffering from COVID along with their medical providers and caregivers the people who live in Afghanistan, who live in fear and danger, and the families and children of Madagascar who have suffered from a four-year drought. I ask your prayers for Father Devin, Janet, Linda, Robin, Julie, Michelle, Molly, Brent, Frank, Gavin, Tasha, Larry, Scott, Maria, Khadija, Sarah, Gary, Edward and Mary, Gretchen, Emily, Mart, Harriet, Pete and Linda, Mary and Mike, Nancy Matura, Ben Dysert, Nancy and Perry, and all others on our parish prayer list. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Lord, hear the prayers of your people, and what we have asked faithfully grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God.
God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will and our law. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves, and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that you placed us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior Jesus Christ that we may abide in your love and serve in your will. Amen. Amen. May the Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. God's peace, God's peace, God's peace. Good job. That's a lot of, a lot of stuff up there. God's peace. God's peace, God's peace, God's peace. God's peace to everyone. God's peace to you. Thank you. Please be seated for the announcements. Good morning. Um, I have a couple announcements. We're going to have some fun announcements today. So first of all, I want to give you um, an encouragement during coffee hour. Um, as you notice, we have uh, been praying for veterans today and those who serve our country. Uh, on a table in the living room, there's a bunch of cards. And, and if you just write a note to, uh, if you'd like to write a note to our service members, we'll get them distributed to folks who are serving um, here and abroad. So please take a moment during uh, coffee hour to do a minute, one or two or three or four or five of those. Um, uh, yesterday was our diocesan convention, and we are part of the Diocese of Southern Ohio. Um, the bishop had a really good message, um, and that's online at the diocesan website um, about where we're headed as a diocese. Um, and uh, there were six resolutions, and one, they passed the budget, but then there were six other resolutions. One recognized St. Paul's Logan um, moving from mission to parish status, so that's a time of celebration for them. Um, the next one uh, approved the next uh, mission share calculation, which is how we contribute to the diocesan operations. There was another resolution to add to the mission share more money to make a capital reserve for churches that need a roof or need HVAC and that sort of thing because the money allocated for that hasn't been enough. That did not pass, uh, but there was lots of discussion about other ways to raise that kind of money. Um, one, two, three, okay. There was one that was we passing a resolution forward to the uh, general convention of all the Episcopal Church next um, summer to continue the beloved community effort, becoming beloved community effort across the Episcopal Church and to allocate $2 million for that. That's money outside of the diocese. Um, another resolution going to general convention to recognize uh, Bishop Barbara Harris in the what's called the Lesser Feasts and Fasts or Holy Men, Holy Women book, to have a day set aside to recognize her as the first um, first black bishop and I think the first woman bishop in the Episcopal Church. She died last year, so it's time to, to recognize her, her uh, contributions. And then the last one was to continue the uh, reparations task force that the diocese initiated to continue to study to um, how, how we can do some of the right things around uh, taking care of past things. So that's kind of the, the diocesan convention report. We also have with us today Kathy Sofak from Homes for Families. There are um, prayer and chair concern uh, for this month. So, Kathy, the pulpit is yours. Good morning. It is my profound, my profound privilege and blessing to be with you today. It's been a beautiful morning. I've been a part of this sacred home since 8 o'clock this morning in the early service and had an opportunity to share coffee with members of the church between 
this service, and I have felt nothing short of welcomed. And I thank you for that um, as a parish and as fellow humans. We need a lot more of that in the world today, don't we? It feels great to be out and about. It feels great to be in front of people and to be able to share updates about the organization I serve. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit today about Home for Families and emphasize a bit what separates us from other organizations that are serving the same, the same mission and the same purposes of rising people out of economic in instability. Home for Families is a new name for us. You've likely heard of us called the Homeless Families Foundation prior. St. Albans Church has supported our organization for many years. And on behalf of the clients and staff at Homes for Families, we thank you so much for those gifts. <clears throat> we decided last year in the middle of strategic planning and rapid growth due to need to change our organization's name from the Homeless Families Foundation to Home for Families. And that's based upon the word home and defining home and what home is for folks. We do not serve homeless people. We serve people who are striving to define home in very challenging times. And for all of us, that, for all of us, that has a different meaning. For people who are struggling with social injustice and generational poverty, it can be overwhelming. I myself become completely overwhelmed by all of the issues at hand, affordable housing, affordable wage, social justice. It becomes overwhelming. As a community, as a nation, as a people, we are addressing the challenges and we're working to move away from social injustice and generational poverty. What Home for Family does along the way is provide a holistic approach to each family one at a time where they are and what their needs are to go beyond shelter, to go beyond a house, to move forward to a home. And so the gifts that you provide are those that many people would have provided through a family that they don't have, a natural family that many of us have benefited from. I'm reminded so often of my life and my life's journey and how that one thing could have occurred that I could very easily be one of the clients that I work to serve every day. I recall deciding I was going to be a nurse at 18 years old, signing up to go to Valparaiso University, having all the finances in line, my parents in the car. We arrive and I go through all the orientation and all the classes and realize that I'm going to have to take science and math courses. <laughs> and my poor parents, when I got in the car to go home and I said, I'm not doing that. No one said there'd be science and math. And that was going to be my career. I was gonna serve people by caring for them as a nurse. I'd gone through all those steps as a child and been future nurses of America. And this was my passion, my profession, and my life plan. And I wasn't gonna do science or math. Had I not had those two strong parents in the car who took a deep breath and gasped and said, well, you're 18 and we were ready for you to move on, that would have helped me breathe and realize that I should not go down that path if that's how averse I was to science and math, that I would not be successful and help me shift gears and go to Otterbein University and go into a field of English journalism and decide many other paths along the way of where I've landed in nonprofit leadership. I think of that story and think of people who are in a situation where if they realized they had a plan and then there was a moment where they said there's science and math and I can't do it and they didn't have those parents in a car with them, what would have been next? We have people who don't have anyone around them in situations much more critical than the ones I described about my career. What Home for Families does is we provide a social worker, a trained person for each family that comes into our circle to go to where they are on their path. What do you need? Do you need transportation? Do you need daycare? Do you need health insurance? Do you need employment? Do you need to learn how to write a resume? Do you need groceries? Do you need a month's rent? What is today's step to get you to tomorrow? What is tomorrow's step to get you to the next day so that you're never without a home again 
and let's create a home and not a house and not a shelter so that your children will be raised in a home, a home as you define it with what you need. The gifts that you provide today to Home for Families allow us the financial security to be able to provide those resources for those families as they move towards stability. The backpacks that you provide, the supplies for the school-aged children, it's not about come down to the center and here's your backpack because you're a needy child. It's about a teacher, an educator, handing that backpack to that child and saying, your family at St. Albans Episcopal Church believes you're going to have a successful school year. And this is a gift to get you started along the way. And here's your backpack. We steward every gift we receive to go to where the family is, meet them with their needs, and celebrate from the peril to the promise. Thank you, Reverend Larry. From the peril to the promise that the gifts we're sharing are going to move them to creating a home, a home for families. Thank you for everything you've done to support our organization today, yesterday, and hopefully tomorrow. The opportunities are great. The impact is felt. And on behalf of everyone I serve, we say thank you for your gift of humanity and for promoting justice, peace, and love for all. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned last week, I uh, just retired recently as president and CEO of Lutheran Social Services after 10 years. And over, over those 10 years, I'm very, very familiar with the work of Homes for Families. And it's certainly a worthy cause. And I'm just here to affirm that and say amen to your, your great support. So thank you all. So walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, all holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. For you are the source of light and life, and you made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation abused one another, and rejected your love. Yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word made mortal flesh in Jesus born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior, Jesus Christ, took bread. and When he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that with Abram and all your all them and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now that our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive, and forgive us our trespasses, as, as we forgive those who trespass, who trespass against us. And lead us, us not into temptation, temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the kingdom and the power, and, and the glory, forever, forever and, and ever. Amen. Amen. Gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of 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 Christ, the bread of heaven.
Together, let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Now send us forth as people forgiven, healed, and renewed, that we may proclaim your love to the world and continue in the risen life of Christ our Lord. Amen. Live without fear. Your creator has made you holy, has always protected you, and loves you as a mother. Go in peace to follow the good road, and may God's blessing be with you always. Amen. Amen. Go forth into the snow rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.